My name's um, Professor Emily Keatley. I'm from Loughborough University in the Centre for Communication and Culture. Um, and I've been doing research for longer than I care to remember in <laughs> um, at the intersection of media and communications research and memory studies research. And um, so I'm coming coming at this from a from a media and communications background. What I'm going to talk to you today about is I, I want to just to say a little bit about postcolonial memory studies, what we might might think uh, think of it as, uh, and why we should care. Uh, then I want to think about a set of methodological challenges that postcolonial memory studies poses for researchers in this area, and then think about uh, a potential methodological framework for for, for studying it. So um, I'm going to launch straight in. So memory studies has, um, in recent years, it's become much more sensitive to transcultural features of contemporary remembering, certainly in, in, in the West, but also um, uh, in, in other parts of the world. And it's been much, got much better at considering diversity in memory of inequalities in and through remembering and the ways in which marginalisation is evident in and addressed through memory and remembering processes. However, attention to what we might think of as a distinctively post-colonial memory, i.e. memory that's indivisible from the politics and power structures of colonialism and decolonial processes, has largely been the pre preserve of post-colonial studies, somewhat unsurprisingly. So memory studies has been kind of um, um, on the sidelines, if, if you like, uh, in relation to some of these questions. So Michael Rothberg's written about this, you know, quite, quite a number of years ago now, that, that actually there's been this kind of... Um, separation between post-colonial studies and memory studies. So I'm sort of starting this presentation from a position which argues for drawing together post-colonial studies central focus on the production of memories in and through the power structures of colonial post-colonialism and the sensitivity of memory studies to the practices and processes of doing remembering across and between different national contexts and cultures. So the explicit aim we might think of post-colonial memory studies as having is to understand this relationship between memory as process and memory as product after colonialism and to uncover or 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 we might think of as during colonialism different forms of colonialism has structured not only what can be remembered in contemporary social life but also how and with what resources and to what ends and obviously for today's purposes I, I don't want to address the conceptual and theoretical questions that underpin this I want to think about the empirical dimensions of these um, issues so this is this is a methodological question as well as a conceptual or a theoretical one. So understanding the contemporary conditions and consequences of remembering uh, the colonial past requires researching post-colonial remembering as a lived experience, contemporarily and historically situated, comprised of sets of practices as intersectional, always emergent, and as future oriented. So we need to think about what, what we need to do, I guess, in the first instance. So empirical research on remembering practices as embedded in post-colonial power relations is essential for a number of reasons. It's essential if we're going to understand the dynamic relationship between memory as product and process as they're enacted in and through colonial and post-colonial power relations, if we're going to understand the complex positioning and intersectional identities of post-colonial subjects and the ways in which post-colonial relations of power are negotiated, reproduced, and challenged through remembering processes. So we've been trying to grapple with some of these uh, questions in an empirical um, setting um, by doing some empirical research in this project called Migrant Mem Memory and Postcolonial Imagination Project. And it's a five-year project. It's actually going to be a six and a half year project now because we have an extension uh, funded by the Leap Team Trust. And we're looking at cultural memories of partition and decolonization in uh, the South Asian diaspora in the UK. And we use cultural participatory methods and it's a split site ethnography. So we're working well, with, with communities in the Midlands and in London. So what are the methodological challenges that we've encountered? Well, the first, the first challenge is, is about, about pain uh, and, and the painful nature of, of post-colonial remembering. This is a practical question, it's an ethical one. So, the first of these challenges derives from the often inherited nature of memories of colonialism and the complex intergenerational dynamic in play in post-colonial conditions. Intergener intergenerational communication of the past is always 
essential part of the complex and multi-layered ways in which remembering is socially experienced and practiced and performed across time and space in different social categories. And we've written about, I've, I've, I've written about this quite a lot with my colleague, Mike Pickering. But the radical shifts and ruptures that resulted from decolonizing processes make these generational differences in the monarch inheritances even more pronounced and challenging. Radical differences in circumstances between generations make the communication of memory particularly difficult as inherited accounts are op often those of rupture and change rather than succession and continuity, making their integration into mnemonic stories and narratives of those who inherit them particularly complex. Okay. So the attention to the facticity of memory. So when we when we talk about truth in memory, this often um, elides and decenters post-colonial subjects from uncomfortable and painful narratives in which they're implicated, particularly those which challenge contemporary identity. And so this is there's this tension between how do you inherit painful pasts and painful memories? How do you articulate those? Um, and 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 this kind of tension between first and hand experience, second hand experiences of pain is a methodological challenge uh, to deal with. OK. Uh, and this links into this idea of epistemological uncertainty around a second hand memory. So the first is about access, how you deal ethically with these um, ethically with these um, questions of, of painful inheritances and then people's concern about how truthful they are. I only know this second hand and, and, and that's a particular, a particular issue in and of itself. And there, and there are sets of spatial dimensions that, that are really important. The memories relating to the post-colonial past also present challenges for doing post-colonial memory studies research with diasporic communities. Remembering practices and processes traverse across continents and produce memories characterized by hybridity as they emerge in an interstitial moment of cultural translation located at the intersection of past and present, public and private. This is particularly so for post-colonial remembering as mobility across space as well as static bodies in changing places are irreducible features of colonialism and decolonizing processes. So in the MMPI project, many participants are geographically removed from the physical place spaces of former colonies and live outside the nations that were created as a result of partition. However, there are very strong connections that are maintained through family and national imaginaries with other spaces. So how can we kind of elicit fragmented memories, spatially fragmented memories, and how can we understand these as distributors uh, in, in a wider memory ecology across complex um, spatial divisions? Uh, and then there's the diversity of experience. When we talk about post-colonial memory, we're not talking about one thing. The scale of colonialism on its own means that we're talking about radically diverse uh, sets of experiences. Um, and so bringing these together in, 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 in some sort of um, uh, methodological approach is, can be quite challenging. And those differences occur even across communities and within communities. And dealing with diverse experiences of decolonial processes is, can, can be very challenging. Um, and there's also the, the sense of um, people's multiple positions within a, a colonial and a post-colonial um, context, you know, gender differences. Veena Das has written extensively about this in relation to 1947 partition of British India. Uh, that the narratives of un, uh, uh, the narrative's unfinished character meant that the event lived on in different versions in the social memory of different social groups. So um, it, people are always positioned in, in complex and multiple ways. So trying to understand the ways in which post-colonial memory is performed is a methodological challenge because we have to deal with such radical diversity. Okay. So what are we going to do about it? <laughs> I guess is the next question. Um, sorry, I, I'm just sitting over my own slide, so I'm just going to move it. So, oh, am I missing a slide? No, just skip past one. Um, I think there are four things that I would say, this isn't perhaps an a, a integrated methodological approach, but it's a set of methodological principles, I think, that we might want to think about. The first is dealing with this issue of diversity and complexity, the last thing that I mentioned. How do we deal with that um, in, our, um, in our empirical work? I would suggest that one way we have been dealing with this in the MMPI project is by integrating collaboration and community engagement at all levels of the research. 
I think it's very difficult coming in as an outsider to understand um, how different positionings impact on people's mnemonic experience. And working with groups that are already embedded with, within communities is absolutely essential to understand that ecology before you even start. So dealing with those complex um, complex um, multiple positionings in research design means that partnerships, community collaboration and community engagement in research, the research design phase, in the data collection phase and also in the analysis phase is absolutely essential in order to be able to make sense of, um, of, of the diversity that we're talking about. The second thing is um, inherited memories uh, in changing socio-political context. How do we deal with the fact that uh, people are talking about uh, second-hand memories often? How do we deal with this challenge where people say, well, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but actually the, the, the meanings that they've inherited are, are, are of, of, of considerable value in understanding how, how uh, experiences of, 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 of colonial and post-colonial um, life get transmitted and handed on uh, was to embed it, um, creative methods uh, in, in, in what we did. So thinking not just about the role of recollection, but the role of imagination, of um, cultural and creative expression and practice in allowing people the space to step outside of those things or tell me what happened. Tell me what happened is actually a very challenging question when you are in epistemologically uncertain position. Um, so allowing people to express not just their knowledge, but their feelings um, and their thoughts about uh, decolonial processes and then tr tracing where the, 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 the roots and influences within those through an ongoing process of, of creative engagement, which is really, really important. I'll give some examples of that in a minute. And then how do we deal with painful pasts? Well, this is this is not just a problem for obviously for, for for post-colonial memory, it's a more, more general problem, uh, but it is something that we we thought long and hard about. Processes of participation were really, really important in in decent, you know, decentering the traditional one-on-one -on -one interview um, and allowing people to um, create spaces for themselves where they could express themselves in ways which weren't necessarily. Um, sort of a question answer um, set up, allowing people to have space to articulate their own pain, but in their own ways. Um, and we used everything from stories around food and storytelling, poetry, photography, um, to try and uh, allow people ways to, to address painful pasts, which um, were, it, it's not that we ever thought we would get, get away from the painfulness of it, but allow people to express them in ways that they found more comfortable. And then the spatiality, um, how do you deal with multiple sites? Um, well, we were already dealing with multiple sites in this project because we wanted, we were very keen that we didn't take London an urban centre as a, as, as a uh, defining um, kind of space for, for, for post-colonial memory. And we, we looked beyond that to, to you know, small market towns and other places. Uh, but thinking about how we address between here and there, the, the cross-continental uh, dimensions was really important. And so we, we actually went off and traced the, the memory networks, communicative networks um, that people worked across and between. So we did field work in South Asia with family members and friends of people that were uh, people that were located here. So I just wanted to sort of give a little bit more detail. How, how much longer do I have? Do I have about five minutes? Five minutes. Lovely. OK, I'm just going to give a little bit more detail and just a couple of examples um, that might just help. It. You know, explain a little bit more what we've been, been doing. So in terms of collaboration and community engagement, um, it, the things it helped us with uh, in terms of navigating these complex ecologies of memory and understanding people's position in relation to decolonial processes and colonialism was ensuring that we recruited participants beyond those who were immediately visible. Uh, some people in the communities that we were working with were very visible, were very accessible, uh, and were very comfortable talking. It was abundantly clear that there were groups within the, uh, within the community or in the fringes of the community um, who, who were less accessible, less well heard, uh, and working with partners, we were able to really think through how we access different parts of the community, which we felt was essential. It also meant that we could develop safe and culturally appropriate data collection activities 
that actually some things just weren't appropriate with some sections uh, of the community and, um, and we, were, we, we were able to discuss these and talk through some of the challenges with people who really understood the, 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 um, the context that we were working in and that was, that was fabulous. Um, and it meant that through the analytical process, we were able to talk through what we were finding and ensure that in that process of interpreting qualitative data, that we weren't homogenizing experiences, we, we were remaining alive to differences. And the interpretations that we were making of those, the inferences that we were drawing were, were appropriate. And, and that's no, nowhere is that more important than particularly as you know, my own positionality as a researcher, as a white middle-class woman coming into largely working class uh, brown communities um, and and obviously you know belonging to um, that that historical trajectory of, of colonization in a particular way it was absolutely essential that we that we made sure we um, address that fully and properly um, and these are just some of the people that we worked with um, in terms of creativity um, it, it was it was about opening up the role of imagination in data collection to think about memory as involving co-dependent, co-creative ways of knowing, um, to allow multiple tracks for people to progress down and to find ways of expressing themselves, which might be um, not through traditional forms of language. And we weren't imposing kind of traditional interviews on people who didn't want them. And it also allowed us to deal with the fragmentary and unstable nature of post-colonial memories, that there were big gaps and there were kind of very um, in, in, intense or um, symbolic moments, but they didn't necessarily conform to a narrative structure as we would understand a life story or a, uh, or a historical account. And using non-narrative cultural forms of communication allowed us to respect the integrity of, the, of those memories as, as they were, as they were um, articulated. So here's just a few pictures <laughs> from some of the activities that we did. Uh, some photo workshops, uh, some cooking workshops, um, uh, and various different things. And then the question of managing pain. There were the ethical questions where we distinguished between, between trauma and painful pasts. Um, we were clear where, you know, where, where it was appropriate to talk about one or the other. And to develop ways of eliciting people's accounts. Um, without amplifying their pain and that's really really hard and we didn't always get it right so finding ways for non-narrative articulation that people found comfortable developing collective participatory participatory settings where people wanted to do that and also decentering the researcher you know this idea of the the intervening person who questions all the time allowing people um, the space to articulate themselves in ways they felt comfortable was really important and there was cooking was really really crucial to that uh, I'm not going to go through that because I'm uh, attending, uh, running out of time. And then I'll just give you the pictures actually about the spatiality because I've already mentioned the international field work. You know, this is just some of the pictures um, from uh, the South Asian field work, uh, interviewing friends and relations of, of participants uh, in the UK and thinking about how memories were transmitted across these two different settings, thinking about the different ways in which memories articulated in different locations and, and through different kinds of networks and the role of media and communications technologies in doing that. Um, and yeah, we, we, we visited the different key sites um, in Bangladesh in this instance, Dhaka and, and, and Silet uh, and our Pakistan field work was unfortunately disrupted by COVID. So that was all done remotely, so less exciting. And then just a few conclusions. Post-colonial memory studies has particular methodological challenges, which actually just go beyond the issue of reflexivity of the position of the researcher, which is obviously important, but there are other questions to answer. Um, and, and those four things that I talked about, community collaboration, using creativity and imagination um, in, in um, data collection, thinking about ways that we manage pain in research interactions, and accounting for spatiality and mobility are all four things. Uh, are essential to, to, to addressing the ways in which post-colonial memory is articulated and how it fits in with this kind of uh, understanding of post-colonial power structures. That's it. My name is Abigail and um, I have been working in the field of learning disability and learning for quite a few years uh, and autism. 
And uh, I'm going to be talking today about um, my current doctoral project, um, which uh, is based at the University of Southampton. I'm a member of the Centre for Research and Inclusion there. Uh, and uh, I'll be using the, a lot of um, pictures and um, the stills are all taken from the video that I've used in my research. So that starts from this um, uh, introductory slide showing one of my participants at work. Um, so I'm going to be talking about using video to revisit experience uh, and to stimulate discussion, dialogue, uh, exchanges of views uh, in, in qualitative research. So a quick outline, I'm going to talk about uh, exploring experience in qualitative research. I'm going to talk about experience versus memory. And um, uh, then I'll go on to my research project and why I chose the method, the rationale for my methods. Then it'll be quite kind of a messy account of how it actually worked in practice, uh, how things changed um, and what I think I've learned from that experience. So quality research, we're always uh, or very often talking about exploring people's personal experiences and, and seeking cultural understanding through that. So we take that perspective that reality is subjective. So you can only know it as people tell you about their experiences of it. So that involves methodologically um, engaging with people's accounts of experience, often through interview. And the question, the problem that I have wrestled with a lot is, is how you make that engagement um, you know, lively, interesting, uh, meaningful and, and not superficial. And uh, I have, in a way, followed this dialogic turn in social science of using dialogue and communication for uh, a, way, as a way to understand um, reality. And in particular, it's been about video supporting that dialogue. dialogue. So I want to start by um, talking for a moment about Kahneman's view of experience versus memory. Uh, and I'm doing that partly to undermine it. So um, he says that there are two selves, an experiencing self and a remembering self. And uh, the experiencing self does that living for you. Um, it passes through a succession of moments, but most of those are, are lost and forgotten. Uh, and all you're left with is the remembering self, um, which is a, a summary story about your understanding of the experience. Um, so he, he specifically contrasts memory with a film of experience, uh, as if, in fact, uh, experience is equivalent to a film, which I think is highly debatable, but uh, he, he sets up a contrast between the two. And in particular, memory is edited, it's time compressed, and it's a story. So in his version, the experiencing self, who does the living, has, doesn't have a voice. Uh, and he says that the nature of the story depends on a very simple peak and end rule. So whatever was the maximum kind of intensity moment and the closing moment of an experience determine the story that you tell about it. Uh, and so memory in that way is, is tyrannical because that's what you carry with you, and that's the input for your, for, for your future behavior. So my experience has not been like that at all. Um, and <laughs> I, think that, um, I think that the difference is really to do with the messiness of lived experience versus the sort of clinically controlled uh, and experimentally controlled circumstances that Kahneman investigates. Uh, so he investigates something like um, experienced pain over a, a short period of time where people record as it happens their level of experienced pain and then they summarize it at the end and the two don't quite balance. But uh, so 
So memory seems to me to be very malleable and doesn't, ex doesn't follow this uh, peak end rule um, because memories, oh, sorry, memories are subject to bias. Uh, so the versioning of what you remember and how you remember it according to what matters at the particular time of remembering or time of asking. Uh, so, for example, a very simple thing like a mood congruent bias where your mood at the time of remembering um, selects uh, how you remember. And I think this is important methodologically, and it's something that I think I've kind of used and relied on in, in, in the research. So the starting point was uh, the methodological starting point was um, video stimulated recall, reflection and uh, dialogue using what Mail has written about that, uh, which I've kind of summarized here uh, in, my, in some of my own words and some of hers. <laughs> it's a retrospective think aloud interview technique where you allow the interviewee to re-experience a film situation after the event perhaps immediately after or perhaps some time after. Uh, and it, it may be useful to make accessible things that are, are difficult to see and know uh, in the moment. Uh, it combines data about participants' behavior, what they actually did at that moment, with the opportunity to think about uh, what they were experiencing and examine the thinking that, that came with it. And um, in this, in this uh, version, the interview material is the data that goes forward for analysis. So my project uh, title here was about uh, what young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can be and do, their capabilities. And it's about work, um, learning, and social participation. So just summarize the context here because some of the um, videos that I'm gonna show will, will kind of draw on that context. And I'm saying that at the end of schooling, when people with intellectual disability can't get into uh, employment, that that's a kind of uh, a deep social, spatial and experiential divide in their lives um, between people who are in the a mode of employment and the time that that dominates and the processes and experiences that it provides and the people who are cut out of it. And amongst other things, it leads to a lack of means to develop as an adult, to develop skills and, and social connections and, and to have agency. And so what I mean specifically about have agency is have any ability to influence those facts, to influence um, uh, what you're able to do and be. And the specific point is that um, uh, a policy uh, has changed, a relevant policy has changed to make it possible for eligible people to employ a personal assistant who they choose and they uh, brief and um, work with, and that this might um, increase the possibility for them to work um, and the social participation and the learning that comes with that. So the question revolves around what kinds of reciprocal social and cultural learning can be recognised. So I'm looking at a lot of things that are highly difficult to see in the moment. Um, I'm looking at uh, social and cultural learning. So that is learning that people are not really aware of their their um, absorption from their environment and from their interactions and how those interactions also provide learning for the partners of the interactions for the people that they work uh, with. So there is quite a knotty um, methods challenge in looking for something that's thought to be very difficult to see, under-recognized, uh, and I'm doing it where the person with the intellectual disability is the kind of key uh, informant. And so 
uh, the methods have to be adapted to give them agency, if you like. So there's an added role to the sort of VSRRD idea uh, in this context. And I envisaged this at the beginning in these sorts of terms, that it would support collaborating with, with people, um, reliving a shared experience where I had lived through it in the first instance, and they had, and we could um, relate to each other over that. Uh, that it would provide a much richer stimulus than the kind of visual supports that are often uh, given to support and communication with people with intellectual disability. So simple uh, visual symbols or um, sort of easy read with, with illustrative photographs. And I see that as very uninspiring and unstimulating. And so I was hoping that uh, a, a sort of rich vis visual and auditory stimulus on a matter, uh, on a topic that was important to the interviewee um, would provide that stimulus. That it would rekindle memories of events and, and provide new perspectives. That it would provide opportunities for, for direct comment. So rather than setting up a situation by explanation, by memory, this happened, then this happened, and I thought, they can simply comment on something that's happening um, in front of them. And I thought that it would allow attention to what people do rather than just what they say, which um, in the context of people whose speech is uh, less articulate might be very important. But I also thought that it might support my own memory because I'm living through um, complex, fast moving events and um, paying attention to multiple things. And it might help me to sort through those. And I realized that I put here a picture of the library uh, job, which was the least fast moving and eventful of all of them. But there you go. Um, so an outline of the methods that I used is here, and then I'll go into each kind of step separately. So I filmed participants at their work. They're already working, they already have somebody supporting them, and I go and film them on several different occasions. We then uh, go through the film together, check it and edit it with them. I use that video to support an interview with uh, the person working, the primary participant. And then I use the video to support interview with the other participants. So these were people around the primary participant family members here, parents, uh, the PA, the support worker who was working with them, uh, and co-workers or supervisors in the sort of work situation. So how did it work? Um, there was a collaborative planning um, event that I hoped would, would give them the means to um, direct to some extent what was going to be recorded. Um, that actually didn't really work because they just wanted to be recorded. And um, the idea of framing it in some way wasn't, wasn't of, of interest to them. Um, it was also interesting that the participant acted as a leader through these filming events, because I've gone to their, their territory, um, doing the things that are very familiar to them, and they are showing me what work they do. Um, so, uh, for example, there was a participant who introduced me to people as we passed as a reporter, and he was going to be on the nine o'clock news. Um, and I became uh, the camera operator. So, following and recording in a very op opportunistic way. So, in the literature about using video methods, um, there are a lot of caveats about the power of the researcher and the power of the kind of framing of video. And I have to say that in this case, um, that was absolutely not the case. It was a question of being given a, a slot, seizing the slot, filming everything, and then dealing with it afterwards. So the filming itself involved a really sustained engagement with the participants, and there was um, 
lots of, of activity and um, a certain amount of talking. And we'll show a clip about that in one minute. But first of all, I'll just talk about the permissions. Um, from a practical point of view, it was extremely difficult to set up. There were coronavirus impacts. There were delays. I had to get permission from employers um, and from uh, deal with the problem of members of the public appearing. So this is a short clip from uh, showing a participant. He's on the edge of a playing field in his rural town, and he's a self-appointed sort, of, sort of community litter picker. And it's a job that he sees himself as a sort of ambassador uh, and um, uh, has quite a high profile in the community for doing this. And uh, this is just a clip from video. Yeah. Right. This one must be special. No. <laughs> Amazing. So he back. You probably can't quite see. He found a twenty pound note, um, but to me, this short clip um, it tells a lot about the way he works and his attitude towards his work. He, he, he's incredibly thorough. He's very um, conscientious, um, but there's also a whole lot about the lack of um, the lack of content when transcribing to words. So. Um, I have some uh, parts of, of video content where there are no words, but there's still uh, a lot to be said, and a lot of interpretation that can be made. And this is an example of, of how the kind of embodiedness of experience and the sort of affective um, and sensory aspects are, are missing. Oh, so, so the edit and label um, procedure. Um, I intended for participants to have a, a, a veto over what was taken forward. Um, I imagined that there might be parts that they they didn't like, that they didn't want to be shown publicly. And that was absolutely not the case. In fact, they saw it as um, a means of showcasing themselves and their work uh, that was just important in itself for that purpose. So the clips and the labels were, and the labeling was largely made by me um, as, so, so I uploaded to uh, YouTube for the purposes of sharing. Uh, and here is um, a transcription of about five minutes, sorry, a, a labeling of about five minutes of video. And um, I've labeled it according to the things that he says, um, and the events that happen in the video so that they can be retrieved um, quickly. Um, so this kind of process is incredibly time intensive. So you're watching, um, there's a transcription process, there's loading, saving, um, uh, labeling and checking labels and timestamps and so on. The reviewing, remembering and discussing um, process. So the video was really effective at engaging people's attention and, and, and interest quickly and establishing common ground, something that you've done together that you're going to talk about together. Um, choosing a clip uh, turned out to be a really efficient kind of nonverbal way of establishing what you were going to talk about that either party could either party could, could do. Um, the behavioural responses were, were strong. There was kind of sustained interest and engagement. And this illustration, sorry, the um, picture here shows a, a participant with very high support needs who uh, has no speech at all. So uh, the process of showing him was 
demanding and I didn't know what was going to come out of it. Uh, but he, he looked at the clips and his attention is, is not always entirely under his own control. He definitely focused and paid attention to what was going on. He has one sign, which is this thumbs up, which he gave to the sight of himself working in, in, in the video clips. And also behaviorally, he, he got up to leave the minute a particular clip finished and the screen went blank. And then he came back the minute the next one came. So there are no words, there is no transcription to this process, but it, it did tell you um, quite a lot. Uh, and there were practical and technical challenges here that were quite demanding. So I'm taking the equipment to people's homes onto their territory, the lighting conditions, the, all those sorts of things are very nearly completely out of my control. Um, so, uh, so that was tricky. Um, so I'm now going to show an example of the kind of, of um, record of work that participants saw as self-explanatory. It didn't really need any, um, any gloss and, and my questions didn't really seem to them to, to be needed effectively. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is um, a participant working in a community sort of um, zero waste type shop, a member cooperative. And he's the boy on the left and his personal assistant is on the right. And he's just learning to use the till. <laughs> Oh, so if we were in a room, I'd really like to ask what people think they can see in this clip of of him working. Um, but instead, I'll I'll just suggest some of the things that I think are there. You know, I think at the beginning it shows, you know, his focus and his engagement, his effort, um, and uh, it, it shows a kind of coordination between the two of them. Um, there's a lot of information about the context, which is important um, when discussing participatory learning, which is which is my um, my theme. Uh, and then I think that the end shows, obviously it shows awareness of being filmed, but I think it also shows a kind of, um, a kind of um, pride in his work that, you know, I did it. So uh, reviewing with the other participants, so here are some, some parents um, reviewing the video of their daughter working. Again, the video is just really effective in quickly starting up an engagement and sustaining a dialogue with you know, people that otherwise you, you don't have um, much knowledge of. And for these parents, uh, it was their first view of their daughter working they hadn't ever observed it uh, and they were very very keen to get some understanding of how it worked in these dialogues um we talked about the specifics of what was happening uh, on screen there was a lot of discussion about that um but there was also um uh, a, a process of kind of continually zooming out uh, I'm going to sh show some of that in a moment. There was um, dis discussion of interpretation by the other people I'd talked to, so we could uh, uh, we could evaluate um, interpretations that other people have made, whether it was myself or the primary participant. And it was possible to put together information from 
different sources and here is an example of that so um this is just after uh, the start of um the daughter's work and they notice that the um the, the support staff of the um pa has just sat down in the corner and opened his phone and she's I off suppose he's redundant isn't he well, yes, for this period of time, um, for both my visits, effectively, he didn't need to do anything. No, I, I think the feedback I've had from the library is if things don't go quite right, they don't know how to deal with it. Yes, and, and that's I, why he's there yes. it's for when things don't yes. go right. And Fiona made that quite clear that it's it's with backup that, up. that she feels. So I'm not I'm not sure how loud that was. It sounded a bit a little bit quiet to me. But um, so we start from the point that the um, support staff is looking at his phone, and she says, "I suppose he's he's redundant." Um, and I say, which they you know don't know that. In my observations, he he hadn't had to play an active role at any point. And then the, the um, father uh, adds that um, he's heard from the from the library where she works, and he's had an account of um, how they can't cope without the the, the support assistant. Um, uh, and I add the information that that the daughter, the participant herself, had had discussed this topic with me so it was a lot of information from a lot of different sources that's all kind of resolve revolves around the video um this is um a a quick example of the zooming out process so here uh, this is a parent speaking again and she has just discussed her daughter returning to work after lockdown and um, um i ask her what difference does it make to her to be able to go back to work um, after after lockdown? I think in a world where she's so sort of looked after and guarded, really, mm, where mm. we can't feel safe that she's crossing the road, mm. or we can't feel safe that she'll, when we're out, she'll unlock the door to somebody mm, she mm. shouldn't, mm. or something like that, in that sort of environment that she's used to, I think it's freedom. Mm, mm. Yeah. So in case that was too quiet as well, she says, um, in a world where we're so preoccupied with safeguarding, what it means to her is, is freedom. Um, so quick, my, my, my lessons learned. Uh, watching and discussing a video that is personally meaningful to the people that you're talking to revolves around their own interests and experience. It um, sustains exchanges of information and, um, sorry, uh, and um, interpretation. It can help people to re-remember things like reinterpreting what, what, what work used to be like before, lockdown to after lockdown. Uh, the memory most benefiting from the record was actually mine. So it gives you a really kind of intensive resource that you can reimmerse yourself in um, to build your understanding of the participants and their worlds um, and their points of view. Um, and I found in particular that it it reminded me that experience is embodied and sensory and affective. And it's research traditions that lead us to focus on the remembering self, that the summary storytelling that happens, um, it, it happen, happens in words in our research methodology. Um, participants saw the, the, the film itself as evidence of what I was looking to examine. It's evidence of work, it was evidence of learning, it was evidence of participation and it didn't need any kind of additional gloss from their point of view and I think effectively that that that's right and that the film itself is a, a, an important source of data for analysis 
and it usefully enforces a different approach to analysis that I'm kind of still wrestling with. Um, and uh, video and dialogue can help to bring together those two selves that Kahneman saw as, as, as so separate, the experiencing and the remembering selves, um, and, and helps with that sort of versioning of, of uh, this building a dialogue around different versions of events to decide what they might mean. So thank you, and that's it. My name is um, Deborah Madden, and I'm a cultural historian based at the University of Brighton. And uh, I'm also director for the Centre for Memory, Narrative and Histories. And I'm just going to pop a link into the chat because I always want to do a little plug for the centre. Uh, we're always very, you know, very keen to get sort of uh, people involved and particularly kind of PhD students. So please do check out the centre and uh, see if it might be of interest. And my work is predominantly shifting at the moment. I mean, my, my kind of historical work has always been interested in the re relationship between kind of narrative life writings and cultural history, particularly in terms of um, cultural histories of medicine. Um, but currently my work is concerned with the cultural politics of emotion and specifically grief, mourning practices, spontaneous sites of mourning, and the ways in which personal, individual and collective expressions of grief can mobilize memories of the past. And um, thanks very much to Melanie um, for inviting me and to the other panelists. I've already learned so much from the two talks and seen sort of really interesting uh, points of connection. So today, um, oops, for some reason it doesn't want to move forward. Bear with me, I'm trying to get the slides to move. Um, okay. Ah, there we are. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an oral history and creative arts project that was undertaken collaboratively during the UK's first and second lockdowns. So the talk is a sort of retrospective, but it's also because the oral histories are still ongoing, it's, it's kind of work in progress. It's a very dynamic um, project that's obviously based in the center. And the people on the slide, these are the people that were involved and are involved in the project as it goes along. So although our project did predate COVID, um, we, um, we also started to create, um, curate oral histories from palliative care clinicians and staff working in care homes, um, primarily to capture and evaluate everyday subjective experiences and emotional responses to the pandemic. These oral histories, um, as I said, are still ongoing and we're planning to kind of continue this work into its last phase um, following the UK um, COVID inquiry to gather responses to what emerges from that. Um, although, um, so work here also drew on um, a pre-existing heritage lottery funded centenary arts and oral history project, which was about the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. Um, we use this, um, historical pandemic as a heuristic device as part of the kind of ongoing project when capturing perspectives on the differing affective scales related to illness, dying, grief and mourning during, during our own pandemic time. Working closely with Inroads Productions, um, a Brighton-based theatre company, we utilised a range of creative practices including creative writing, um, site responsive theatre as a mode of public history and critical pedagogy. Um, key themes um, from our combined oral histories, uh, the combined content of that became the basis of a scripted performance um, <clears throat> called Breaking the Silence, 
And that was written by um, a creative uh, called, um, her name is Sarah Clifford from Inroads. And it was performed to a live audience via Zoom in October of 2020. And this performance formed part of a collection of so-called COVID stories that were hosted by a, a Damn Cheek, again, a Brighton-based produ production company. Um, and importantly for our purposes, this, co this company is, is committed to shining a light on social injustice and equality, thereby using the creative arts to explore tensions of modern life and politics. In um, leveraging very um, different sort of methods and practices, the purpose of our project was to raise political and ethical questions about the uses of the historical past as an act of public history and critical pedagogy. This has been prompted by the political, political context of the government's uh, militarized NHS nationalism during the first phase of COVID-19. Our mixed methodology sought to draw attention to the hermeneutics of historical inquiry when investigating the emotional reg registers of past pandemics in light of contemporary concerns. This was um, an explicit acknowledgement of the history making processes themselves. We also wanted to draw particular attention to our collectivist principles of collaboration as a form of critical praxis when mobilizing politically engaged histories. And in taking a non-linear approach to history and mobilizing multi-directional memories, our methodological practices encapsulated what Anna Hickey Moody describes as the eclectic ethics of invention. Of course, this invention was born out of the necessity of pandemic times. The work has since been published in the form of a collaborative article, which situates these methodologies and creative practices within a framework of public pedagogy, and hence it featured in the Journal of Public Pedagogy shown here. Out of our use of oral histories with end of life healthcare staff during COVID-19, um, these indicated the ex to the extent to which people needed to capture their experiences and get their stories heard in ways that could also facilitate a multi-directional exploration of both public and private grief. And indeed, we were struck by the extent to which healthcare staff were keen to talk about how they coped during the pandemic, but also the necessity for, the, for, for these to serve as an impetus for highlighting urgent political issues within end of life care. Our project's analysis thus included the UK's um, coalition government's austerity measures and accompanying reduction for funding social care between 2010 and 2015, particularly in terms of weakening the response capacity to COVID-19 within an already beleaguered sector. And this was a recurring point in our oral history respondents as it, it, it expressed uh, itself as a, a deeply felt anger tempered only by a hope that the experience of COVID-19 might see a change of direction in policy and future funding. COVID-19 was thus seen as an opportunity to shift perspectives and improve patient experiences of end of life care and increase resourcing for palliative care, um, palliative care teams in the future. As noted here in the couple of extracts taken from our interviews, Care teams had to constantly adapt to changing regulations, adjusting the assistance they could offer, as well as specific resources key to the principles of end of life care. The interviews show the unique and harrowing challenges that COVID-19 wrought, the volume of patients dying alone, separated from their families, the loss of physical contact as a form of covenant, comfort and presence, poorer communication due to the barriers of PPE, as well as the heavy emotional toll on staff and their own families. The therapeutic value of end of life care was also compromised with, with uh, complementary and uh, holistic forms of care scaled back or only accessible uh, remotely by digital technologies. 
Yet interviews also evidence hope that the pandemic might facilitate more open conversations about death and dying, and thereby, thereby changing misconceptions about end of life care itself. <clears throat> Our project's emphasis on cultures of grief therefore facilitated a much more expanded and politicized sense of, of multiple reactions beyond just the clinically defined symptoms of grief, important as they were. The social and cultural responses picked up on in our oral histories highlighted COVID related deaths and added psychological draw and the added psychological drama uh, trauma, sorry of loved ones uh, dying alone and funerals taking place with uh, restricted numbers because of social distancing measures. Underfunding and neglect within end of life and social care was an important contributive factor for several oral, oral history respondents with the backdrop of austerity evoking a profound sense of discomposure, particularly when the government co-opted the plat for carers and localised community support for the purpose of NHS nationalism. Significantly, perhaps, the constellation of these contested concerns, combined with the mobilisation of localised activity, can be seen in the different memorial practices for COVID-19, most of which were instantiated very quickly. There were, uh, there were the incorporation of COVID memorialization into the Armistice Day for, for 2020, when the NHS rainbow featured alongside the poppy, and where the British Legion's poppy appeal included images of soldiers who'd been deployed to build Nightingale, Nightingale hospitals around the UK. At grassroots level, of course, we saw a counter narrative in the unauthorized and spontaneous, somewhat spontaneous national COVID memorial wall on the South Bank organized by bereaved families seeking justice at the government's mishandling of, COVID, of the COVID crisis. And this one year anniversary site of mourning became a political means with which to tackle injustice and the silences surrounding those deaths that weren't officially recorded. The national COVID memorial wall formed part of a broader politics of grief, allied, of course, with the politics of care. As a member of, uh, as a number of political theorists and cultural critics have shown, including Judith Butler and James Staniskew, mourning by dint of recognizing the finitude, vulnerability and grievability of others is always a political act. And this political dimension of our project um, was a key aspect of, of the oral history responses themselves and our project as a whole. What our oral histories with palliative care and social care staff re revealed was a very clear understanding of the wider impacts of collective grief, what one respondent referred to as societal grief. And here respondents interpreted grief as complex and multifaceted, pertaining to individual and family bereavement, but also to communal and collective forms of grief as well as lost time, loss of freedom, and an uncertain future. Our political engagements with nonlinear histories and multidirectional memory, therefore attempted to fold together past, present, and alternative futures. The collaboration evidenced a range of effective meaning-making processes through an exploration of historical death, dying, and mourning by bringing the Spanish flu and COVID-19 pandemics within the same analytical frame. It should be noted here, however, that our project did not entail making direct comparisons with, or so, you know, the idea of learning from the Spanish, uh, Spanish flu in didactic ways. There's not time here to map out the very interesting points of contact between the two, but we were also very keen to show that although these comparisons are interesting, um, this in itself had its own limitations. Rather, the collective experience of COVID-19 helped to uncover another interlocking history lying behind an entrenched national screen memory of the First World War. Within um, historical scholarship, the Spanish flu pandemic has been mischaracterized um, as the so-called forgotten pandemic though its scale was deliberately hidden by, gov by governments in Germany, England, France, and the USA at the time through censorship in order to maintain wartime morale. Its obscurity within mainstream British history and cultural memory 
is due primarily to the ritualized national and local commemorative practices around both the First and Second World Wars. And this was further compounded by the recent centenary events of 2018, despite a proliferation of localized creative arts projects and initiatives around the UK that aimed for the inclusion of other narratives, experience and perspectives that also in some instances included the Spanish flu. Living through the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, meant that it was possible to see the multi-dimensional impact of that pandemic in ways not fully realized at the time or admitted since. And re-articulating hitherto silenced memories about the Spanish flu was a means of historicizing contemporary cultural politics, as well as evidencing a critical method with which to develop an historical awareness of how emotions were experienced or might have been experienced in the past without in any way universalizing those. And in this reg regard, the centerpiece of our project was the scripted monologue based on, uh, based on some of the oral histories collected from both palliative care staff, as well as intergenerational memories of the Spanish flu. And these were further contextualized with primary sources from the local archives. The script itself was perhaps a good example of what uh, my fellow panelist Emily in, uh, in her work with Michael Pickering has called mnemonic imagination, a deliberate move to reconfigure linear time by reactivating archival sources. These methods help to explore everyday experiences and emotional responses to pandemic illness both then and now. The scripted performance itself focused on the character of Joy seen here, an older woman who is mourning the loss of her cousin and lifelong friend, though because she can't attend the funeral in person, is unable to grieve properly and is attending via Zoom. And this represents a type of disenfranchised grief when a person's grief is not socially facilitated or a public mourning is denied. It marked a very specific moment during uh, the first lockdown when numbers uh, attending funerals were restricted and research at that time. So a lot of research has obviously been done since this study here. But this was the research that was available at the time that we utilized. Uh, which indicated that 59% of respondents interviewed um, believed their, that their grief had gone unacknowledged in the midst of global pandemic. So the research was carried out by the Sue Ryder Palliative Neurological and Bereavement Support. So the character Joy, um, her narrative, moves through different historical time frames and temporalities, shifting between various emotional states and affecting behaviors uh, which indicate a deeply felt historical empathy. And these registers focus alternately on personal, social and political subject experiences changing seamlessly in perspective between family and collective memory of the First World War and the Spanish flu, as well as current experiences of, of COVID-19. So to try and wrap up, if I can, in um, what our project revealed is the value of, of uh, material that is co-constructed and created in very different methodological ways. Uses of the historical past with oral histories, creative writing and performance proved vital for a deeper exploration of the differing affective engagements and disengagements resulting from COVID-19. Analysis of these different modes and its creative context for wider public pedagogy and engagement drew attention to both the historical and contemporary cultural resonances of everyday experiences of pandemic illness and the politics of grief at, a spe at specific historical uh, conjunctures. Um, modes of public engagement, sorry, I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, Modes of public engagement have significant value in their own right as artistic interpretations, of course, but they also have enormous capacity to yield critical insights into, into the processes of creative practice as effective, relational and embodied. And this pertains to the politics of history making and the formation of historical knowledge, how traces or atmospheres of the past invested with feeling 
might be reinterpreted and reactivated through oral histories and creative practice. Our research process evidences emotions that are historically situated and politically situated too. Yet reactivating the archive through embodied memory can in this very process of effective encounter help attune us to somatic and emotional re registers of the past, or at least an exploration of them. Further to paraphrase Anna Hickey Moody, effect is often the way that art can speak. Artistic, experimental and activist engagements and, and enactments of public pedagogy have the potential to create new ways of being, new ways of doing, new ways of feeling and knowing. <laughs>